Good morning. Uh, my name is Rachel Nelson, and I am the Director of Educational Initiatives and the Associate Director uh, of Community Relations at the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland. The last two months have been so challenging for all of us, especially our brothers and sisters in Israel, um, who have all been so traumatized since the horrific attacks on Hamas, uh, from Hamas, Hamas attacks in Israel. I want to share some of the work that the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland has done here in Portland in support of Israel. On October 9th, we held a solidarity gathering at Congregation Neve Shalom, where 1,200 community members joined us in person and another 1,800 streamed the gathering. We've had nearly weekly webinars since then with a variety of speakers, including survivors, IDF spokespeople, and journalists, as well as hearing from our partner organizations on the ground in Israel. Uh, we will have these weekly Wednesday Israel-focused webinars through the end of February. Check out our website, which we'll put a link to in the chat for more details. Late November, we held a, a vigil for the hostages. We are so relieved uh, that over 100 hostages to date have been released and are hopeful for more to be released as we go as time continues. Our Israel emergency campaign has raised over $2 million, funds going directly to Israel for rebuilding and trauma care. We have also been working with our local Israeli community to make sure that those uh, who have family members in Gaza are sharing those stories with the media and that these families remain in the public eye. We are working hard to ensure that our Jewish students in public and private schools and university campuses are feeling safe. We are doing our best to counter, counter anti-Semitism that has been spiking since the October 7th attack. And you can read our weekly emails from our CEO, Mark Blattner, every Tuesday sharing this information. Also, we are encouraging everyone to make calls to your members of Congress. They need to hear from us. They need to know that we expect and we urge them to remain steadfast with their support for Israel. I can assure you they are hearing from the other side, and we need to make sure their early support stays strong through these times. Finally, we've created a hub for all things related to Israel. It's in the chat. Uh, you can uh, follow up uh, for you to follow up with. You can find that again on our website. While our presentation is happening, the chat has been disabled, but please utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom to submit questions. The session, as always, is being recorded and will be available on our website. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Israel Story is an, an award-winning podcast that tells extraordinary tales about ordinary Israelis, often called the Israeli This American Life, where they share stories of everyday Israelis in the most unique way. I personally have been a loyal listener since the very first episode. I also have had the unique pleasure of knowing two of the four founders as teens when I lived in Jerusalem and having been peripherally connected with Mishi Harman, who is a, a host and senior producer. Since October 7th, they have shifted their work to the wartime diaries, snippets of what people are experiencing right now. Today, we will be joined by two of the producers, Adina Karpuch and Mitch Ginsberg. I'm going to read their short bios, and then they will come on and share with us. So Adina is a Chilean native who grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. After traveling, traveling the world for a year, she moved to Israel in 2015 and now calls Jerusalem home. She has a BA in psychology, sociology, and anthropology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In her spare time, you can find Adina running through the through one of Jerusalem's many parks, hiking by the Dead Sea and in the Galilee, or searching, excuse me, searching for plants to propagate. Mitch is a former military cor correspondent and fiction editor. He has lived in Jerusalem for the better part of the last 30 years. He is the father of four, a professional translator, an amateur foodie, and a diehard but mediocre cyclist. So Adina and Mitch, thank you so much for being here and welcome. And I'm gonna pass it over to you now. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name's Adina uh, and I'm here together with my colleague, Mitch. Um, I will just explain a little bit about Israel's story and then um, hand it off so that we can talk a little bit about what our experiences has been like since October 7th, both as citizens of this country and also as um, producers. Um, so Israel Story, for those who don't know, um, is a 
podcast that tells human interest stories. We make audio documentaries. We've been doing it since 2011. Um, originally, the show started out in Hebrew um, and only in Hebrew. Um, we made it pretty quickly onto um, the Army Radio, which is um, kind of the most popular uh, radio station in Israel. Um, and we became very popular very quickly. Um, and then in 2015, um, our co-founders decided that um, it was time to turn to the uh, international um, audience and we uh, turned the show over to English. Um, since then, we've made over 100 episodes, well over. Um, we're the largest Jewish podcast um, that exists. We have um, hundreds of thousands of listeners in over 190 countries. And basically what we try to do um, is tell the story of Israel through the people that actually live here. Um, we have covered everything from um, a Haredi rabbi who became a, from the old city, who became a um, Jewish teacher, uh, a female Jewish teacher of um, rabbinic studies, um, to the man trying to get his picture on a um, hummus uh, restaurant's wall, to um, the story of three birders, um, one of which has ALS, who created basically an empire here of birding um, and everything in between. Um, and in normal times, uh, we tell long form narrative stories that our episodes run about 60 minutes each. Um, but actually right before the war, we were in the midst of a project called Sign Sealed Delivered, where we were telling the stories of the um, 37 signatories on the Declaration of Independence, which if you've been following um, the news about Israel, you know that the Declaration of Independence and the judicial reform took a very really center stage here. Um, and immediately as the war started, um, we turned over to Wartime Diaries, which we'll be talking about today. Um, so that's a little bit about Israel Story. Both Mitch and I are producers there, and I'll hand over the stage to Mitch um, so that he can tell you more about Wartime Diaries and our experience. Great. Thanks, Adina. And then we'll go back to uh, Adina, who also is going to tell her about her experiences. Um, so I thought I would start, first of all, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I thought I'd start with where I was on October 7th because it was in so many ways such a shock, I think, for everybody here. Um, for me, it was a, a huge shock as well, not least because the events of that morning, Shabbat, Simchat Torah, um, October 7th, I was in the middle of a seven-day trek in, in the highlands of Scotland, something that I'd planned on doing for a very long time. And I was with three friends, all of whom are Israeli, uh, three Jerusalemites, um, old friends of mine, like two other, myself and two others, and another Israeli who lives in London. And I remember that on that morning, we, we looked at our phone, and I think the first thing I saw was that image of a ISIS looking Mujahideen bearing Toyota Land Cruiser type vehicle in Stehot. And that it, it made such an impact. I mean, that wasn't a terror attack. That immediately it almost became clear to me that there was a form of an occupying enemy force from Gaza. It was just shocking. And for us, it was really early in the morning. Um, and we went to breakfast in this gorgeous inn that we were staying at in a tiny town in Scotland. And my friend, who's also a journalist and also Israeli, um, Mati Friedman, if you know him, and he said to me, let's not talk about this over breakfast because uh, he was already concerned about what sort of reactions it might get. Of course, nobody else had knew anything about it yet. And then we set out for a day of trekking and by far the worst weather I've ever known, just like rain so that there was no way to even think of taking your phone out. 
and I didn't know anything throughout the day. Uh, shiver, freezing all day in just a diagonal rain that 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 persisted unwaveringly throughout the day. And then um, when we finally reached the end point of that hike, we all looked at our phones, and the news was so devastating. It was just like one of the worst moments I can remember. And in one of my group chats which is the most active one I have with my old army buddies. I saw that one of the guys whose son is currently now in Gaza and then was guarding the border for the Golani Brigade had written a sort of farewell to his parents, which is awful in so many different ways. I felt both like the immediacy of these things and the fact that you can, on the one hand, speak with your parents while under fire, on the other hand, be in danger of you know losing your life within a moment. And it was really, there was just this terrible lump in my throat. And um, if you, you know, I won't go into any more details, but I, the next day I decided to to cut short the trip and, and, um, and I came back to Israel and sort of got lucky and managed to get on a flight and was back um, the following. So that, uh, not that, was, that Saturday was the day we was Sunday. I was in transit and was back on Monday. And Pretty soon after that, we had meetings where we thought, how will we address what was already clear was an enormous and unprecedented, and I'm pretty sure the worst disaster since the founding of Zionism, of modern Zionism, and and, and really a failure in so many ways of what is at the heart of Zionism, which is, of course, a sense of security and protection for Jews, like an unbelievable violation of that in Israel. Um, for Jewish civilians. And so we decided that one way to tackle this massive story would be to, to try and shine spotlights on many different people and offer them people who were either directly or indirectly tied to the events and offer them like, you know, a spot on stage for a bit where we could hear their voices and what they went through and what they were feeling, although less about what they were feeling both for those who went through trauma, we decided it wouldn't be too good to ask them that the facts would be better conveyed than, than really how they feel about what had happened, because we were told that that's a little bit dangerous territory, and um, and started really to head out um, into the field. And the f I want to talk about a few, and then if you have questions about other ones, if you've listened um, later or any other questions, of course, I'm happy to discuss. So the first one that I went to do was, well, I, you know, the first one that, that I did by myself and that um, was really the second one that we did all told was um, with an old friend of mine who served with me in the army. I'm 50, he is as well. And he was at home in Giva time in central Israel and when this happened, we haven't been in reserves for 10 years. Um, we all served in a combat unit in the paratroopers. And when this happened, he immediately sent out a message, um, both to somebody who he knew in the Shin Bed internal security, like the Israeli FBI, and to a guy who was an old commander of ours, who is like 52 or three, and has some sort of He's an officer, he's a senior officer, he's a colonel, and he has a job in the reserves. He asked both of them, let me know if you need me. And the colonel said, happy to have you. And he told me that by around 10.30 in the morning, he was he had gone through a very brief, classic Israeli truncated volunteering plan, and he was in uniform and serving with this colonel. And I met him outside our old reserves base. And it was, everything moved me about that interview. It was really impactful for me. Um, I remember showing up at that very reserves base in 2006 when we were drafted for the second Lebanon war. And the feeling, it's, it's a very strange feeling to leave your life as a civilian and and enter through like this one simple gate into the army and, and really enter into a different world different things are expected of you and 
and certain things that are valued in the civilian world are utterly irrelevant in this new world and vice versa. And then um, I let him know, he told me, tell me when you're there. And I let him know and it, it was unbelievable what was happening outside the base. I never have seen it like that. It was nothing like the Lebanon war. The road, it's a pretty central road, like, um, like one of these like route, like not a massive highway, but like one of these um, state highways in the US and um, it was just double parked cars all the way for as far as I could see of reservists who showed up and the cars were parked out there and there were like people barbecuing for the soldiers outside, it was night. And I interviewed him in the car because we needed quiet or something close to quiet. And um, and just sitting there on the side of the road outside this army base in the dark and speaking with a very old, very close friend of mine. And he, like I said, had joined up on the 7th in the morning. And they didn't have really like a frontline role but they did uh lend a hand on the fighting in the kibbutzim which went on for several days after the seventh um amazingly tragically um and and he just described to me in the rawest way um what he had witnessed and to speak also with somebody in this case not a stranger but somebody that i know so well and to feel the change in him has definitely stayed with me throughout. It was kind of remarkable. Like he was, he described terrible atrocities that he had seen. And that was the first time I'd heard it firsthand. Um, and then he also described for me the impact that that had on him. And I, I could see it was such a change. By the way, he's a, a school principal. He's an educator. He loves children. He's always hugging children. He's a very nice, jolly guy. And then to speak with him like that in the dark in that close car after having come back from the Gaza border after this attack and to hear what he had witnessed and the way it moved him and the things that he felt afterwards were stunning to me. So that's one interview. And then the, the next one I'll talk about, I think, is um, a few days later. And it's interesting, the ones that first come to my mind are, are the first ones we did for some reason. Um, Something that left me with a different feeling, but uh, a few days later, I went with, uh, I heard about these Moshavnikim, so kind of like farmers and, and kibbutznikim, who were going down, to, had gone down to volunteer in Kisufim, which is a kibbutz. They said it's four kilometers from the Gaza border. To be honest, I think it's probably less. I think it's more like two and a half, but let's say, so like two and a half miles or so. Um, and they were going back the following day and, and they, they, they said I could join them. And so I went down, um, and the plan was, and the reason they were going was to help the kibbutz transfer 680 cows, milking cows from their dairy shed to other kibbutzim and moshavim because the head of the dairy had been ambushed and murdered along with all the workers in the kibbutz. They had, I think, six Thai workers and, and they also had been killed in the attack. And so for like a day or more, they, they couldn't really get to the cows and they all could have died both of thirst and what have you. And, um, and they were gonna go down and move the cows, which is incredibly laborious and quite, pretty tricky. It turns out you can only take about 25 per truck. And uh, we showed up there and that meeting was really different for me. It was all these old kibbutznikim, kind of crusty moshavnikim, and that really buoyed my spirits working with them. It was it was amazing. At first, I thought they were doing it for the animals, but they quickly assured me, like like most farmers, that they were doing it for the farm and for the kibbutz. And you know, this was a it, it was considered one of the best dairy sheds, and they wanted you know that the that the whole enterprise wouldn't just die along with the cattle. And um, so I went down there and again, it was, it was eerie to see, like, I could see where the fence was cut. I could see where the dairy, 
the, the man who ran the dairy farm where he'd been murdered. Um, his car was flipped over. And just like 15 yards away or so, uh, the actual bodies of the terrorists were still there. Their ammunition was splayed all about like RPG launchers and what have you. Their motorcycles were were mangled and and laid out on the asphalt in different places, sort of like where they lay. And um, and then here were all these guys. There were there was occasional mortar fire. Um, it was a closed military zone. And here are all these guys, utterly untroubled, and just working on like herding the cattle up onto the truck. Um, and and one thing that stuck with me that I remember that near the end, as it was, it's a lot of work. And um, towards the end of the day, uh, this officer shows up. He's a captain, and he's got like a ceramic vest, and he has uh, a pistol, and he's got an M16, and of course the magazine is in. He's wearing a helmet. He's got tons of gear. He shows up to all these old kibbutz like Some of them were over seventy, and and he says to them, "All right, guys, I've wired up all of the." ammunition that the terrorists left here and I'm going to detonate it because I need to detonate it so it doesn't explode somehow else. So I'm going to ask you all to get into the Migunit, which is like the shelter, so you don't get any shrapnel or shards or whatever and um, and I'm going to explode it and then you can come out and keep doing your work. And they looked at him like a very sort of ineffectual substitute teacher and they said, no, we're going to load the cattle and then you're going to do your little explosion. And he was like, no, no, you don't understand. They have it all wired up. Here's the remote. I, he shows them the remote. He's like, I have to push this button to the remote and we have to blow it up because it's, it must go now. And, and they were like, listen, it's going to be dark in two hours. We've been working since morning. We'll finish. Then you'll make a little explosion. And there was something, A, super Israeli about that interaction and B, kind of left me feeling good. Like, A, I wasn't at all concerned, even though we we were so close to the Gaza border there, there was something about their company and B that that sort of just gentle defiance like um, left me with a better feeling that day. So those are two episodes that I wanted to discuss. Um, and Adina, if, if, if you want to go maybe and we could talk more afterwards, is that okay? Definitely. Uh, thanks, Mitch. Um. So I was home um, the morning of October 7th. Uh, both Mitch and I live in Jerusalem. Um, I'm an early riser. So I woke up at 6.30 um, STEM, uh, just, just by chance. Um, and I saw, I looked at my phone um, because that's what I do in the morning and it's terrible. And I saw a video um, of a white pickup truck um, with a bunch of masked men um, with big guns. And I looked at it and I said, wow, Gaza looks um, a lot like Israel. Um, that was my reaction. I was completely confused about what was going on. I thought it was like some Hamas um, promotional video, some political advertisement. Um, and, you know, I did my normal morning routine. Um, and at seven, um, we had a siren. So um, my partner and I, who he was still sleeping, uh, ran out to the uh, stairwell. Um, that's the safest place we can go. And it was pretty surprising. Um, and, you know, we hadn't really had a siren. I had been in one siren before um, in Jerusalem. And, and really, that was my only experience. Um, so, you know, the siren passed, we went back in, started kind of looking through social media, looking through um, news sites. And we saw that there were terrorists in Stilot. Um, And it was shocking and it was weird. Um, and I immediately texted my cousins um, who live on Kibbutz Be'eri. Um, now they're used to this kind of thing, not to the terrorists, but to sirens. Um, they're very used to it. And I'll say I have an uncle um, and his wife and their three daughters who are 10, 13, and 15. And he texted back immediately. Um, yeah, all good. We're in our safe room. Don't worry about it. Um, and then there was an iron, another siren here and there were endless sirens there. 
back and forth. We were texting, sending selfies um, as if it was just another day. And then I remember um, seeing a video of a grandmother on a what's called like a kalnoit in the kibbutz. It's like a like a golf club, uh, like a, a golf cart. Um, and she was smiling and she was with all these people. And I said, like, wow, like AI is really good now. Like this looks totally real, um, but it must be fake. And that's where that's where my mind was like, there's no there's no way that this is happening and that this is real and that um, what what they're saying is going on is going on. And kind of throughout the day, things started to become a little bit clearer. Um, back and forth texting with my with my uncle and running to the stairwell trying to figure out what was going on um and I just kept texting him did the army is the army there is the army there is the army there um and he kept saying not that I know of but you let me know um and all of a sudden they didn't have electricity anymore and there was no reception for a while and they ran out of phone battery um and and the army kept not showing up and we were trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and about 9 p.m., um, my partner and I were watching the news and um, there was a woman named Asya, I'll never forget her name, um, who called into the news anchor and said, I am in my safe room in Kibbutz Be'eri, um, please help me. Um, I've been in here since 6.30 in the morning. Please help me. And this was live TV. And she is um, she's telling the anchor that she can hear the terrorists outside. Um, and and they told her on live TV, Asya, send us your location. And I said, okay, wait. If that's what they're asking for, then, then I'll get my cousin's location. And then I um, was on this wild goose chase of getting all of the bet like biggest tv anchors um numbers and sending them my cousin's location as if maybe they can help maybe they can tell the army and i was calling everyone i know with power um and and at 2 30 in the morning they were saved um all five uh which is crazy to have to say that all five were saved um and and i was destroyed i was totally destroyed um the next day, uh, we found out that my partner's um, cousin was murdered. Um, we had been with him at a wedding on Thursday night. Um, and and shock doesn't begin to cover it. Um, that night, you know, we start we started trying to figure out what do we do? How can we help? Um, we're running to like supermarkets to get dried goods to send to soldiers and and that night I got a text message saying um, there is a group of soldiers that need 10 um, stretchers. They're in the in need of 10 stretchers. Can anyone help? And I said, yeah, I think I can raise that. I, you know, um, there were, they need $2,000. And I said, okay, like I can text my Atlanta family. That's where I grew up. Um, maybe we can figure this out. Um, and we did, and we raised much more. And, and just like Mitch described, um, the next day I was at a reserve Vista base and just the amount of cars and the people that had showed up without even being called saying, I am here, I'm here to help, um, was really incredible. Um, unlike Mitch, uh, who made incredibly uh, the first few episodes um, together with some other colleagues, I... I I wasn't functioning the first two weeks. Um, every time someone asked me how I was doing, I started crying. Um, it was it was really, really hard. And walking out of the funeral, um, my partner's cousin's funeral, um, I realized that the only way I was going to be able to, to get over this, to face this, was to document it, um, to do what we know how to do, what we've been trained to do. Um, and so I kind of jumped on that bandwagon um, and started with with Mitch traveling all over the country in order to document what's going on right now and get really wide perspectives. Um, as you probably know, we were um, almost at the brink of civil war right before this uh, broke out. And um, and all of a sudden, everywhere you go, there are these signs, together we'll win, 
כוחנו בהתאחדותנו, like our strength is in our unity, um, etc. Um, and I was really interested in how really different people were experiencing this war. So I'll talk about three, um, three episodes we've made. Um, and I'll start with Sahar Vardi. So Sahar is a, a left-wing activist who um, through her, her activism um, actually met a, a Gazin, um, he's a, he was a student and he was applying to PhD programs and a writer, a poet. Um, and she uh, basically the first day of the war, um, just like me, she just like us, she lives in Jerusalem. She went down, you know, activist t-shirts as she was telling us um, are all like their pajamas are all activist slogans. Um, and so she was all of a sudden in her um, stairwell, like everyone else. And, you know, there's people who she knows are going to be called to Miluim and there's soldiers and she's, you know, wearing these t-shirts and she felt um, immediately like, wow, this is, this is so weird. What is going on? And, and her mind immediately uh, went to her friends in Gaza and, um, and throughout the war, they were texting back and forth, back and forth, talking about how, you know, once this is all over, she'll write him a recommendation let, let, letter so that she can he can study in the States um, or maybe in the UK. They were trying to find funding options. I mean, this is all during the war. And he was texting her updates about having to move south, but then there being a bombardment there. So having to move back north and eventually, um, eventually he was killed by an Israeli airstrike. Um, she found out through through a mutual friend. Um, and I think the moment that really got to me was was the moment that she told us that she um, she texted him after she already knew uh, she was dead, just to make sure, just to make sure. Really? Maybe? Are you, is there any chance that you're still there? Um, and I could really, really see her pain, um, regardless of, of our uh, political similarities and differences. And then a few weeks later, um, I was, you know, I, I had edited that whole episode and I was thinking about what people are thinking kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. And so I started, I mean, as you probably know, um, Israel left Gaza in 2005. There was the disengagement, um, another thing that almost brought the country to civil war. And I was trying to figure out what um, people who had opposed the disengagement we're feeling right now. Um, and I contacted this woman, Datya Itzhaki. Um, she, together with Mitch, we went to go visit her in her, what's called a caravilla. It's a caravan. Uh, she, she, her and her husband, Arye, still live um, in a temporary home um, all these years later. And she um, was a woman who really, truly believed that being a Zionist means um, living on your land. And Miprinata, um, in her perspective, living on her land means living in Gaza. Um, she lived on another caravan, in another caravan on the Gazan shore, um, right by Egypt um, for many years. And she raised three children there. Um, sh she fought um really with the with the kibbutzim the the kibbutzim that now everybody knows their names Be'eri and Re'im and Kfar Aza um when they told her you are the obstacle to peace you are the reason we don't have peace with the Gazans she said I'm your bumper I'm the reason we you, they, they're not fighting you they're throwing rockets at us not at you um and she even has a video uh with one specific uh, kibbutznik who um, is, has now been taken hostage. Um, they're screaming at each other about about peace um, and about what will be the solution. And regardless of the similarities and differences that I politically have with Datia, I really saw her pain. I really, really saw um, how frustrated and, and hurt she was um, by the events of October 7th. And the third character in the episode I'll talk about is Mor Maizel. Um, this is actually a personal friend. Um, we were in a dialogue group together. Um, 
And on October 8th or 9th, I believe, she sent a, a message saying, I feel really, um, you know, I'll actually just read it. I thought it was um, really powerful. And it's actually what made me contact her to do the episode. She said, my particularly my particular difficulty is that within the joint existence groups, talking about what's actually happening is frowned upon as because it might offend somebody. And in the outside world, saying anything that isn't taking a complete 100% stance with your side gets you shamed and marked as a traitor. Every emotion is felt wide and deep, and all the information just keeps coming like a week-long rain with no sun, which maybe in Portland is <laughs> the usual. Um, and that, to me, struck a chord because I felt like what she was saying is, I can't speak my truth right now. And I really, really wanted to, to capture her truth at this moment. And Mo um, is an interesting character because I think um, she makes everybody mad. It doesn't matter where they're standing on the political uh, map. Um, she grew up um, in a Islamophobic house, extremely right wing. Um, was uh, She used to paint caravans on outposts in um, Judea and Samaria, legal outposts. Um, and she went through a transformation in her life and became a left-wing activist. And today she runs a Arabic uh, Hebrew dialogue group um, where people learn both languages. On October 7th, excuse me, she was with um, Palestinian friends um, and a Bedouin soldier um, in the Galilee. Um, and they spent the day there somehow knowing that this would be the last time for a long time that they would be able to just spend time together, have fun, swim in the water. Um, and and what Mol says is that everybody right now means they're blanky, everybody. Um, whether that means saying uh, Palestinians don't have a right to exist or whether it's saying Israel doesn't have a right to exist, whether it's, um, carpet on Gaza and whether it's this is genocide um what she's saying is right now no judgment right now just let people feel their feelings and feel their pain and just nod and see them um because otherwise um you know we're not going to get anywhere so those are three of the episodes I've really been touched by I'm happy to talk about more if other if you have questions about other episodes you've heard um and yeah happy to to open it to questions thank you so much um i'll start by asking a couple questions and hopefully folks in the q a <clears throat> can add as well uh so for both of you um can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of civil society right now i you know one of the episodes was about the gemachim the, the civil organizations that have stepped up and kind of changed their work since October 7th, some of whom had been solely focused on um, on the judicial reforms and protesting and that sort of thing. Can you speak to a little bit too about what you've seen the, with the civil society stepping up? Um, Where do you want to go first? <laughs> go ahead, Adina. I'll just talk a little bit about um, Ronit Farm. Um, so I got to go uh, together with um, our colleague Alexandra Muller uh, to Chavat Ronit, or Ronit Farm, which normally is a super, super fancy wedding hall um, in the center of the country. And basically since October 8th has been a treatment center uh, for survivors of the Nova Party. Um, we met there with three um, different people who in their daily lives have nothing to do with this. Um, one of them is a, a psychologist. She's a private, uh, sorry, she's a social worker. She's a clinical social worker, um, you know, has her clinic, her clients. And she basically on October 8th um, was driving around, listening to the radio, listening to the horrors and thought about um, all the kids. She, she herself has teenage boys. And she was saying, wow, um, you know, everyone's talking about the soldiers and about the kibbutznikim and about the people that live um, near Gaza, but nobody's talking about these partygoers. 
and she called um, the owner of this wedding hall and said, how soon can we trans uh, can we transform this space into a treatment center? And he said, here are the keys, let's go. Um, and I spoke with her and I spoke with, uh, we spoke with an artist who lives in Carmiel um, in the north of Israel, who said, I know how to um, do this specific technique called dot art. I think it's um, really therapeutic and like meditative and it helps people just like forget everything else. And um, so I, I set up the station. Um, and the third person we spoke to um, was actually someone who um, is a victim of PTSD himself, who um, after many years of treatment um, does uh, body therapy. He's like a masseuse, but specifically around trauma. And he said, um, at the beginning of this war, I, I I was going through PTSD again. I was going through a crisis. Um, and I realized that actually what would help me the most is to help other people um, who are who are newcomers to this. Um, and he, so he showed up. And those are three of hundreds. I'm not like, I'm not exaggerating, really hundreds of people who were there. Um, along with all of the, the survivors of the massacre. Um, it was incredible. I mean, it was incredible. You walk in, it's like a five-star hotel, but for um, for trauma and for therapy. So you have aromatherapy and you have sound therapy and you have masseuses and you have group therapy and, and um, particular therapy and you have people playing guitars and just, um, and, and they're all my age and they're all, um, you know, in their 20s and have been through the worst thing they could ever imagine. Um, and they're all here, you know, also having lunch um, for free um, because because that's the kind of country we have. And that was one of three centers they had at the time. I think they've opened more since then. Um, so that is a little bit of, of that um, aspect of it. My cousin went uh, a couple of weeks ago and couldn't stop talking about what an incredible opportunity and how amazing this was for those survivors. Mitch, do you have any um, anything you want to add about yeah, civil society um, right now? Uh, definitely, it's been overwhelming. Um, a couple of a few things uh, with our podcast. We went one time down. I went with Yael Ben Chorin, another producer, to the Dead Sea about a week after maybe October 7th and interviewed somebody who I know who's a dad at the school where my kids go. And again, his first instinct was simply to volunteer. And so on October 8th or so, he's a former principal also and a teacher who has a different job today. And he called up the Ministry of Education and he just said, how can I help? And they said, listen, we're sending school children down to these different hotels and somebody needs to organize the education. Um, and so he, I, I don't know if he's still there, but he's certainly, I think he is. And he's certainly did that for, the, for ever since. Um, and he just became like the principal or beyond the principal, sort of the supervisor above all the principals of different schools and set them up in order because the hotels, if you were from one kibbutz, let's say Be'eri, they tried to keep most of them from in the same hotel. Um, and then just set up within the hotel, in the lobby, in the bar, outside, in the basement, wherever, uh, classes. And so that's one example, but there have been so many. Um, we went as a group one day to volunteer and we picked like lettuce and parsley somewhere. And it was like these very orthodox sort of maybe, I don't know, definitely Sfaradi, maybe Taimani uh, family, part of the family had actually lived in Gush Katif in, in Gaza when before the disengagement and they were so grateful and it felt so good to just drive for an hour and a half or what have you and work on their farm and, and help. And it was this incredible feeling that that was so different, so very starkly different from what preceded these horrible events. Um, when, like Adina said, we, we felt many of us that the country was on the brink of, of civil war and the, I mean, I have a friend who's been going to the airport every few days to pick up supplies that he's managed to raise money for, for the army and distributes them. And another friend who's pretty senior at a high tech company and spends the better part of every single evening of the week making hamburgers and fries for soldiers all over the place. So you feel it everywhere. And I'll just say it's very much, though, in contrast to what many people feel 
that the government has been doing ever since then, which is a lot of nothing. So kind of along those lines, uh, a question, uh, what, what do you, and this might not be something you can answer, but what do you think are the explanations for the long delay in the IDF uh, arrival to the kibbutzim on October 7th? Uh, I'll go first on that one. <laughs> um, it's a colossal failure. I think a lot of people tend to focus on the on the intelligence side of the failure. I know the New York Times has run articles and a number of Israeli papers have had articles about what they knew and what they didn't, but I really deeply feel like that's it, it's significant, but yet it's still peripheral. Um, the larger failure, I feel, is first of all, why the line was so poorly held, whether the soldiers knew or didn't know. And beyond that, the dreadful failure to show up. I mean, you see it, I feel like most starkly, and it really almost moves me to tears every time I hear about it. How did Noam Tibon, who's 60 something and whose son lives on um, Nachalos, Kibbutz Nachalos, manage to make it down from Tel Aviv by himself and fight to save his grandchildren? How did Yisrael Ziv make it down in his Audi and get to a Kibbutz and save people in risk fire? How did Jael Golan? These are all 60 plus uh, age generals who went with what they had on them in their sneakers and God knows what. And just their instinct was to race down and say and save these people. And many of them did, but it wasn't enough. Where was the Air Force? Where were the helicopters when there were droves of, of terrorists and their lackeys rolling into these kibbutzim to perpetrate some of the, the worst acts we've witnessed in my lifetime for sure? And there's a lot to answer for. There's a lot. But we're engaged in other things now. But the the failure, not on the personal level, um, because there were many, 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 many acts of incredible bravery, not only by discharge generals, but also by by many senior officers. You see, who gave their lives and led the, led from the front and charged into what they knew was probably perilous and like a lethal situation. But but the mobilization of the Southern Command at large was stunningly inept. And the lack of, I'll just say the lack of command, the lack of commanders, right? Even if you had foot soldiers ready to go in, um, the army is the army and it's supposed to work in the way that people aren't um, making decisions for themselves, that there is a system, that there are commanders who are uh, mobilizing people and, um, you know, there's still an investigation to be held, but it seems like that is uh, where things failed. So oh, maybe of... we should also add that our enemy is unfortunately quite evidently very complex, very driven, very willing to sacrifice their lives to perpetrate this kind of thing. And they were successful. So I'm going to ask you about two of the very first wartime stories. The first was the sister of somebody who had been taken captive. Uh, was she part of the released group? No, no she's, she's still not released. Has not been released yet. There have been. She was a soldier. There have been no soldiers released. Okay. And I read the other reasons why young women are not being released. Yes, unfortunately, I, I've also read those. Uh, one of the other stories, um, one of the very first stories, was a father who whose son I believe was at the Nova Festival and he raced down and he saved his son and countless others, just what you spoke about. Have mm -hmm. you been in touch with that father since the interview? Uh, how are how are he and his son doing? Have you followed up with 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 the folks that you've interviewed throughout these these past couple of months? That's a good question. Um we yeah. we mostly don't. Yeah. Um we normally Head there. Um, the, the way it works is um, we're looking all the time for stories and that can be around the Shabbat dinner table. It can be um, now, I mean, we're producing so often that um, there's not there's not like the week long wait. Um, we're reading the newspaper, we are hearing stories, um, friends of friends. A lot of our friends are in the army, um, especially in reserve duty. Um, and so we are contacting people as soon as they um, agree we basically head there usually the next day um, and once the episode is out um, we send them the episode and talk a little bit about that but 
um, we haven't we haven't been in touch since. Um, I'll say with that story, I think the thing that touched me most is, um, you know, this guy is Rambo. He is um, really Rambo. He's a physical therapist, uh, but like super high up in a in a hospital. He had a few guns at home that he could take with him, etc. And then he tells you, you know, at the beginning, I was crying 50 times a day. Now it's 45. So I think I'm getting better. Um, just, you know, this hasn't not touched anybody. You spoke about Sacha and you spoke about uh, interviewing people who are on all sides of the of, of different political spectrum, different religious spectrum. Many of these are not going to be sides that you are necessarily in agreement with and alignment with in your own personal lives, given that this is so personal because this is still happening every day. And I, I observed this when I was in Israel two weeks ago. It's still October 8th in Israel for so many people. How do you separate that personal and professional boundary when it's something you're still living with every day? I think it really depends. I think. Um... I think pain is pain. Um, you know, with Datia, the woman that left Gush Katif, we had a great time. I felt like she was my aunt. Um, we spent hours and hours there um, and and really saw the human in her and in her husband um, and and the, the pain they were in about October 7th, even, even though these were people that they told you are going to be at risk. This will turn into Hamastan. Um, and actually, a day later, I watched a documentary that had been made about her in 2005. And, you know, Datia is in some sort of blacklist um, in terms of the Israeli government because um, she refused to leave. She had to be forcibly removed from Gush Katif. She, they had to bring in um, basically the higher ups of the higher ups just to get this family out. Um, but but what we saw is a human in pain. Um, and I think that's what we see every time we go uh, to interview someone. So so the the, the personal um, becomes the professional um, and, and the same thing. And, and also say something about what you said about October 8th, two things. Um, Last week, I, I was um, there was like the Jerusalem municipality set up something for for young people, um, a concert uh, that was, you know, kind of. Uh, in the shadow of the war. And the the opener was a stand up comedian, um, Hanukh Daum, he's super famous. And he asked the audience there are about a thousand people there. They're all between the ages of 20 and 40. Um, who know who here knows um, someone personally that has been killed and 99% of the hands went up 99 um, and just this morning I mean every single morning Israelis are waking up at 6 a.m to the names of the people that have been killed every single morning uh, the previous night so this morning it was um, the colleague of my partner um, and and that's what we're going through I mean on the one hand, it seems like we've moved on because we are producing stories and we are bars are open and you know people are out and about and we're celebrating Hanukkah and et cetera. And on the other hand, everybody knows somebody. Everybody. And if they don't, they will. And that's the reality of this war right now. Thank you, Mitch. Do you have anything to add? I don't know. That was a really good answer. I don't think. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you wanted something specific, just what I'm happy to try. But I, I can. I have one more question, and then we are um, getting towards the end. So uh, just let's this go past, to the next one. Okay. Just this past mm -hmm. week, uh, you interviewed a, a man, a Druzy man, who uh, was a journalist and had been kidnapped. I believe in I can't in early two two thousand nine. Two thousand one. Two thousand one. Uh, and he. Four. And he's back there reporting in 2004 and he's back there reporting and he spoke to another Druzy soldier. What's, did he talk about what's giving him the strength to go back and to report on the border with Gaza again, after the experience he had, I can't remember how long he, was it 19 days he had been kidnapped? No, it was pretty short. Or, I think, he, but it was very, very impactful harrowing. for him. But yeah, 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 harrowing, yeah. 
did he talk about what gave him the strength to go back to be back on the border again? I mean, he didn't even go just to the border. He actually went back into Gaza and spoke to the troops in in northern Gaza. Uh, I'm glad you asked about him because I don't know. I keep telling Adina how how much that interview has stuck with me. I really, really liked speaking with him. I thought it was really important. I think the Druze are so fascinating and um, I think kind of overlooked or misunderstood sometimes from afar. Um, both because we have the Galil, the Jews in the Galil, and those in the Golan who sort of remain more loyal to the regime in Syria, but the ones in the Galil are exceptionally loyal to the state of Israel. Um, and I thought he was brilliant about it. Um, in terms of going back, I don't remember if he he said that it was difficult, and he said that he asked himself why the hell he was doing it. Um, I think journalists, you know, he made his living in Gaza when he was, when he was taken captive. He, he's obviously a, a native Arabic speaker, um, although the way he speaks Arabic, Arabs can tell he's a Druze immediately. Um, but, and which was why he was targeted, because the Palestinians in general, and certainly those who are looking to harm people who are loyal to Israel, like Druze, or know who's Druze and who's not. Um, and they're in such a fascinating situation, being sort of between a rock and a hard place in so many different ways. Um, being a minority here in Israel, um, and he spoke to us a lot about feeling mistreated and 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 feeling sort of the sharp edge of the inequality that sometimes persists here. Um, but then on the other hand, meeting a Druze officer there, there are so many of them. Um, they're, they're so devoted, it's pretty incredible. And I think, I don't know, Adina, if you remember if he said specifically why he decided to go back, but I, think, I know I he mean, emerged from Gaza with this incredible feeling of of pride about being Druze, because he felt that that's the epitome of what they wanted to take from him. And he linked that to what he felt had happened to Israelis on October 7th, that he felt that the Hamas attack was not an attack to try and liberate Palestine, but rather an attack to try and almost stamp out the Jewish nature of our of our society. That's how he experienced it. What are you going to say? Anything? And I'll just say that I think there was a part of him. I mean, the first, basically, the first thing that happened when we walked into his home um, was that we met his son, and his son is a police officer um, in Jerusalem. Um, and I think there's a part of him that feels really proud to be meeting soldiers and really. Um, uh really certain that what needs to happen now is um is that Israel needs to stamp out Hamas and on the one hand the last time he he left um Gaza he was in the weakest position he could be and now he was coming back as an Israeli journalist meeting the army who had basically wiped out um this neighborhood and and I think it gave him the sen sense of strength and the sense of pride uh, to be Israeli, um, even if if that comes with a lot of obstacles and and contradictions. So we're we're on the hour, Adina, Mitch. Thank you so much for being here today. Hearing your stories uh, and the stories of of everyone in Israel has really given me and our community strength. I, as you can tell, I'm a loyal listener, and I will continue to listen to every episode. Um, so thank you for sharing, and thank you for being here today. Please join us next week as we hear from our partners at the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, and they share with us that the work that they've been doing directly on the ground with survivors and the broader Israeli community since uh, since October 7th. You can register on our website for that and all our upcoming webinars. Again, thank you so much for being here today. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you guys you. so much. Bye.